Let's open our Bibles then, shall we, to chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel. Thank you for that effective um, part of the service. The soundtrack. Uh, um, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Beatles. Of course we are. Uh, for many of us, the, the, uh, the soundtrack of the Beatles played out through our teenage years. So let me begin with, uh, with a, a, a line from a Lennon and McCartney song, in, in My Life. Do you know this one? There are places I remember all my life. We all have them, don't we? Those places that are embedded somehow into our hearts and minds. Some special place, some big moment. There are places I remember all my life. Well, the mountain that we're going to climb this morning was one of those places for the Fab Three, for Peter, James, and John. In fact, this place made such an impression upon Peter that he, he later reflected upon it and he wrote this. We do not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when the voice came from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. We ourselves heard this voice when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So Peter is saying, the place I will remember all my life was not a fairy story. On that mountain we saw, we heard, it was a real event. It's difficult to know actually how long Peter and his friends were up there. A few hours maybe, not much more, but what happened in that short space of time changed their entire lives because that's the nature of such places. They quickly change us forever. Isn't that one of the lessons of this extraordinary week or so in our national life from the EU referendum? Within hours, politics and, and economics changed for good. Everything was in meltdown. I've quoted Lenin and McCartney. Let me quote Lenin, the leader of the Bolshevik Re Re Revolution in 1917. Lenin said this, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. Ask Cameron and Corbyn and Sturgeon and good old Boris. They'll know how true that is. There are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. Ask the Conservative and Labour parties this week. Ask the Governor of the Bank of England. All of them no doubt wishing that uh, the clock could be turned back a week or so, or that they could push the, the, the fast forward button and uh, race through the uncertainty of the next few years. But actually, in the text here in Mark 9, and for the Fab Three on the mountain, especially for Peter, they wanted to press the pause button to stay there forever. In the place that they would remember all their lives. For there was so much clarity on that mountain, so much glory, so much power. The view from the top was breathtaking. Of course, mountaintop experiences in life can have that effect for all of us. And we want to hold on to them, don't we? We want them to be forever. But the disciples couldn't remain there for long. After just a few verses, they walk back down into the valley below. And so must we. So as we open the Jesus file this morning to, to Mark chapter 9, most of that chapter, notice, is not lived on the mountain of certainty, but in the valley of confusion and doubt. And we'll be there next Sunday morning. But here's the point I want you to grasp 
today. When you are in the valley, remember what you saw on the mountain, eh? Because without that perspective, the valley is a tough place to hang out. And that is why Jesus takes uh, Peter, James, and John on this field trip, I guess you'd call it. According to the time check there in your Bibles in verse 2 of Mark 9, six days have passed since Jesus had told the disciples that he was going to suffer and die and rise again. And maybe the disciples had spent most of that time trying to recover from the shock of the announcement. There's a cross waiting for me, said Jesus, and there's going to be a cross in your life too. You see, the disciples had thought they knew who Jesus was. One of them, Peter, had said, you're the Christ, the Messiah. So none of of, of that news from Jesus made sense to Peter. No, Jesus, a rejected and executed Messiah, that cannot be. Peter, it absolutely is. And what is more, the cross-shaped pattern of my life will be seen in anyone who who follows me. Now that is a huge reality check for Peter and the others. Because Peter was committed uh, to, to the glory of Jesus, not the cross of Jesus. He hadn't signed up for suffering, but triumph. Oh, Peter, there is glory to come, Jesus says. And he underlines that in in the verse that we finished with last Sunday morning at the end of chapter 8. Look at it there. When the Son of Man comes in his Father's glory uh, with the holy angels. Yes, Peter, there is glory to come. So the suffering and the cross is not in place of the glory. It's not in place of the kingdom. Uh, Messiah will reign. He will come. But so will suffering, so will the cross. For him and for them, there is a valley of the shadow of death to be walked through first. That's the point. And that's why Jesus takes them up the mountain, because he wants to give them a taste of his glory, to show them the triumph of the future which is really what verse 1 of chapter 9 is all about. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Before you taste death, says Jesus, you will taste glory. So let's take a field trip. Let's go up the mountain. School field trips, I don't know about yours, but school field trips were were never great favorites of mine, other than as an escape from the the routine of of, of classroom life. The idea of spending a cold day in February up the Brecon Beacons didn't really fill me with much enthusiasm. But I do remember the teacher standing at the front of the coach as we were about to disembark and saying, now, class 2N today, I want you to look, listen, and learn. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put on our Gore-Tex walking boots and our North Face fleece and make the climb up the mountain of transfiguration to look, listen, and learn. Firstly, look. Look. But before we see what the disciples saw, in his gospel, the parallel account here, Luke tells us that the field trip began as a prayer retreat. (laughs) Jesus really took these three men to pray with him. And did they pray? No, they fell asleep. Not for the last time, of course. They'll do the same in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the reason Luke gives for their sleepiness in the garden is that they were exhausted from sorrow, he comments. And perhaps the same was true here. 
on the mountain. They were, they were not tired from, from the climb, but from the impact of that shattering news that Jesus the Messiah was going to die. They were sad. They were confused. They were drained by it all. Is it not true that sorrow will make you take a nap sometimes? A broken heart will, will make you go to sleep because you want to escape. You want to walk away. You want relief. This news was, was way more than the disciples could handle, and so they just shut down, and they sleep from sorrow. But while they're asleep, Jesus prays alone. And as he prays, look what takes place in verse 3. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Transfigured is the word used to describe this temporary change in Jesus' physical appearance. It's there in verse 2. There he was transfigured. Now that word translates a Greek word with which all of us are probably very familiar. Go back to your primary school days. There's one of the places you'll remember all your life. Your primary school days. Do you remember those days when over the weeks you, you watched tadpoles in, in jam jars and, or in fish tanks turn slowly into frogs? And myths gave it a very long name, metamorphosis class. The tadpole is a frog in waiting. The inner nature is the same. It's the outward appearance which gradually changes. Metamorphosis. That's what happened to Jesus in verse 3. Only it wasn't instant. Sorry, only it was instant. There was no waiting for weeks like, uh, like the, the tadpole. Instantly, Jesus' outward appearance changes to reveal who he is. For a moment, his divine nature, which has been hidden beneath his human flesh, bursts out in dazzling brilliance. There he is, God in waiting. What has been concealed is revealed in a way that was not true before and would not be true after, just for a moment. And so as the disciples wake, they look, and as they look, well, they struggle to describe what they see. Of course they struggle. There's no way to adequately explain what is going on here. Language folds in on itself. Try to describe a a glorious sunset over Pool Harbor. I know we haven't had many of those yet this summer. But try to describe a, a glorious sunset over Pool Harbor, and you will realize how small your word power is. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Luke says that the appearance of Jesus' face changed. Matthew comments that it was like the sun coming out. And when I read Mark's expression there... His clothes were whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. I wonder if the disciples had had some bad experiences at the dry cleaners recently. These men were, of course, Jews, steeped in a tradition that associated the revelation of God's glory with smoke-filled mountains and thunder and lightning. They, they carried statements with them, like this one from Psalm 104. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. And here it was, in front of them. All that godness focused to a point of incredible light in this man. A man wrapped with beauty and glory, which both attracted and terrified them. Uh, this mountaintop experience wasn't, of course, just a place of transfiguration for Jesus. 
No, it was a place of change for these disciples as well. Their view of who Jesus was grew. It expanded. It took on new shape. And that's what happens to all disciples of Jesus. All true encounters with God are designed for one purpose only, to make Jesus more glorious. We, we look, and uh, the encounter changes us. We are transfigured. The realization of, of God's utter holiness, His perfect character, His compelling beauty, it grows in us. Do you know part of my problem reading verses like this and studying a passage like this? Part of my problem is that my God is too small. And there's just a possibility that your God is a little too small as well. What good a God whom we can stick in our pockets and domesticate? What good a God we can keep at a safe distance? No, the God whom we encounter in Jesus is more glorious than we can possibly imagine. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. So the four become six. Jesus is joined by Elijah and Moses. Notice the alert ones amongst us this morning. Notice that Elijah is mentioned before Moses, which is strange. And we'll see why in a moment when we walk back down the mountain. But for now, notice that these two great heroes of Israel had a couple of things in common. For one, both had left the world in unusual circumstances. They went straight to heaven. Their humanity intact. Elijah in a chariot of fire. And Moses, well, we're not sure, but his body and grave remained undiscovered. Both were also believed to be key forerunners of the Messiah and the kingdom of God. They were going to herald it. And here they are talking with Jesus. What were they talking about? Well, again, Luke is very helpful in his parallel account of this episode. He tells us they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. In other words, Moses and Elijah were speaking to Jesus about his death, his departure. I could well imagine that the disciples, as they were on the mountain, might have thought that Elijah and Moses would be talking to Jesus about the kingdom and the glory and the overthrow of the Romans and the establishment of Messiah's reign and his throne over the whole earth. But they're not. They're talking about his departure, his death. Well, with all of this dramatic stuff going on, someone surely has to say something. Step forward, Peter. Only in verse 6, Mark tells us that Peter didn't know what to say. Of course, that hadn't stopped him before. And given that the last time Peter had said something, Jesus had replied, get, get behind me, Satan. You would have thought that, that, that Peter would have been a bit more careful here. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. Not Peter. He blurts out, then verse 5, Rabbi, oh, oh, Rabbi, teacher, it's good for us to be here. It's great, Jesus. I, I, I think this is a great idea. Let's, let's make this a permanent arrangement, shall we? Uh, we'll build you three shelters, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. What, what's Peter's point? Oh, Jesus, you're, you're on to something here with this kind of glory. Hi, this is what we want, more of this. It's impressive, this shining, dazzling power display and, and, and Elijah and, and Moses to back it up. Much better than all that talk of suffering and, and rejection and death. Oh, we've got Moses, we've got Elijah, we've got you in glory. Forget the cross. Let's just go straight to the kingdom and launch the movement now. Do you see what this is? It's the same old Peter wanting to strike the same old deal. 
no cross, just a crown. No suffering, just the glory. Peter may have looked at the transfigured Jesus, but he still didn't really see. It was time for him and for the others not simply to look, but to listen. Then a cloud appeared, verse 7, and enveloped them. And a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's as if the cloud which enveloped all of them was designed, among other things, to shut Peter up. There he was, burbling on about how marvelous it was and how they should create these permanent shelters of glory and remain forever on the mountain. Oh, Peter, enough, enough, enough. Please be quiet. And so, as the voice of God the Father speaks from heaven, not only has Jesus been seen to be different, the brilliant light, the shining face, the the dazzling clothes, now he is heard to be different. This is my son whom I love, listen to him. (laughs) That makes Peter's reference to Jesus as just a rabbi appear even more inadequate. And at so many levels, Moses and Elijah are not even addressed by the Father. God says nothing about those pillars of the law and prophets. No, here's Jesus, the beloved son. He's the one they all have to listen to, Moses and Elijah too. For he's the one who fulfills their message. The one who speaks the word of God and reveals the nature of God finally and uniquely and supremely. No wonder that from its earliest days, the Christian church came to understand that Jesus was not only the Messiah of prophecy and promise, but the divine Son of God. There is no one like him. Suddenly, verse 8, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Only Jesus is left on top of the mountain with the disciples because when everything else fades, the spotlight falls upon him. Moses and Elijah have gone back to glory, but Jesus remains. And he remains because he has to go down into the valley to face its suffering and rejection and the shadows of death. But as he goes, he takes with him those words of affirmation from the top of the mountain, my son whom I love. You see, Jesus needs to know that the Father loves him and that glory awaits him beyond the cross. These these mountaintop experiences, these close encounters with God, can be places of real affirmation in our own lives. For it's there and then that we hear God speak his love over us and for us. It's at such times and in such places when our security in Christ is deepened and our faith becomes more real to us, Uh, not more true, but more real, more urgent, more powerful, when we know that we are known and loved by the Father. It's it's through such seasons of the Spirit that we learn our place in the heart of God. And we need to know that and hear that and listen to that because we are about to enter the valley. And if we haven't learned about our preciousness to God up there on the mountain, it'll be very hard to make sense of the pain and suffering and despair in the valley below. And it's in that direction which at verse 9, Jesus is heading with his disciples. Verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain. And on the way down, it becomes very clear that these men still have lots to learn. There's our third and final lesson. Look, listen, learn. 
as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what raising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? On the way down, notice that Jesus gives them specific instructions. Don't tell anyone what you've seen up there until after my resurrection. Don't you think that must have been a really difficult thing for Peter, James, and John to do? To keep quiet about that dramatic mountaintop experience? If you'd been one of the three, wouldn't you have been bursting to tell the other nine? Hey, guess what we saw? Jesus' clothes had the personal treatment. His face was radiant. But the ban was because they had so much more to learn. And it would take the resurrection of Jesus before it all fell into place. Only then will they be able to make sense of who Jesus is and and the plot line of his life. And so as they continue down the mountain, they have a question in verse 9 about the future. What do you mean by all this rising from the dead talk? But they decide not to ask that question. And then they have a question about the past, which they do decide to ask him. Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Now, now you see, here's why Elijah was was mentioned first upon the mountain. It, It was believed that Elijah would appear before the arrival of Messiah. And it was this sense of anticipation which gave rise to one of the one of the popular ideas about Jesus back in chapter 8. Remember the question, the opinion polls? Who do people say I am? And one of the opinion polls said, you are Elijah. That wasn't just plucked out of the air. There was enough about the words and works of Jesus to suggest some overlaps with the prophet Elijah. But the disciples, therefore, have an obvious problem. If Jesus is the Messiah and he's here... What's this stuff about Elijah coming before the Messiah? Why do the teachers of the law maintain something that that can't be true? Well, Jesus answers them in, in verse 12. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and uh, and be rejected? I think uh, I, I think that that verse is best understood as a statement rather than a question. It is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. But there's the problem. How do we put the suffering and rejection of Messiah in in line with his triumph and glory? Where does it all all fit? If we only had Mark's account of this incident, uh, we'd struggle. So, in closing, turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 And verse 11, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Look, listen, and learn, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. And then turn to Matthew 17. And from verse 10, here's the parallel account of the transfiguration. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. You see, these references to Elijah find their actual fulfillment in the life and ministry of John the Baptist. And the ministry of John the Baptist was in fact not what the majority of the nation hoped for. They hoped that he would restore the the temple and the nation and the glory of Israel. But here comes John 
And he speaks to them about repentance and forgiveness of sin in order for them to be renewed. So it was a ministry of restoration, but, but not in the way they thought. And, and the people didn't like that. So what do they do? They killed him. Now, back to Mark 9 and verse 13. But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it's written about him. They did what they wanted to do to, to him. You see why Jesus references John the Baptist? Because of the plot line of his life. Just as they did to John, so they will do to the Son of Man. They didn't recognize John, and they won't recognize me, says Jesus. They killed the Baptist, and they will kill me. John the Baptist sets the pattern for the life of Christ. And Jesus sets the pattern for those who follow him. Do you see? So, as we're up the mountain and coming down the mountain, we need to identify with these disciples. And on our way down into the valley, we know that we, have, we still have so much to learn. And one of the most important things we need to learn as disciples of Jesus is to get the pattern right, is to get the order of things sorted out. Yeah, there will be an age of glory and triumph. The program is still in place. You've seen that up there on the mountain. But an age of suffering comes first. So it's back down into the valley. And that's where we're going to be next Sunday morning, as I said, in the valley of despair and doubt, and maybe this morning as I'm wrapping up, you're already there emotionally. In the reality of your life, you are in that valley of pain and confusion and doubt and difficulty and evil. But if you're there in that kind of valley, and whenever you're in that kind of valley, remember, my friends, what you saw on the mountain. Remember what you experienced there on the mountain of certainty. And let the mountain perspective shape the valley right now. For the God who is with you on the mountain will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And you will fear no Uh, Lord, in those valley moments of our lives, in the reality of the order of things as we walk through the valley, may we remember the view from the mountain. Remember what we saw and what you told us and who Jesus is. And may we understand that Jesus walks with us through the mountain, through the valley, from the mountain. Jesus, the one who is crowned with honor and glory. Lord, we see the future coming. Help us to embrace that future with hope and longing so that we may live through the valley of confusion with confidence and assurance. In Jesus' name, amen.